Regional economic, economies growth and design is being sponsored by Hilti, a global leader in providing technology-leading products, systems, and services to the worldwide construction industry. We are fortunate to have two guest speakers who are especially experienced and knowledgeable regarding the cultural, economic, and historic factors that have impacted the Western United States and what could be expected in the future. I'm pleased to introduce John Restrepo, Principal of RCG Economics, and Frank Martin, co-founder and principal of Martin Harris Construction. This will be an informal conversation. I'm going to act as moderator, but feel free to ask questions. Um, and here we go. All right, first question. What are the top three factors in Las Vegas hospitality industry's evolution during the last 10 years? John? Um. Obviously, one of the major factors was what happened to it during the Great Recession, right? And, uh, things kind of changed dramatically. Speak louder. Hello, hello? There. Okay, anyway. It was the recession that, that really changed the nature of what the, the resort industry is all about, what it's developed, what the consumer preferences all are. And as you've noticed, I, those who've been here for, who live here or those who have visited more than once, we, the nature of our, of our resort industry is, 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 is quite different now. Prior to the recession, uh, approximately 60% of all the revenues on the Strip were driven by gambling. That's dropped down to 40%, and it's been replaced by you know food and beverage, uh, shopping, convention, convention, the convention business. So the nature of the tourist has changed dramatically. Uh, not necessarily the result of the Great Recession, but uh, the Great Recession just changed buying patterns and what people spend on and how they, they spend their money. So that has had a dramatic effect. As well, the other thing that's had a dramatic effect, which is not unusual, it's happening all over the country, is the uh, the growth of the millennial population and the aging of the baby boomers. And so those two groups still, are, uh, the, the baby boomers are still a relatively, relatively large group, but their spending patterns and habits have changed, and millennials have a whole new way of spending money and how what they see as a priority of visiting. So to me, that's that's the, uh, the, the, the two of the biggest trends. The third trend, that's more recent, we can talk about that a little bit, that changes the character of Southern Nevada is the growth of the Major League Sports industry here, both uh, the, the, uh, the Raiders coming, the Golden Knights, and I guess now the, uh, the, what's good they're going to do with the new hockey, the new baseball team, uh, the uh, stadium at Summerlin. So there's a lot of things happening there right now that's putting Las Vegas on the, on the board as a more complete, well-rounded entertainment capital or entertainment destination. Frank, from the construction industry perspective, do you have anything to add? So the, John went, that, went to the, the Great uh, Recession, Depression, whatever you want to call it. Um, what happened that dramatically changed the pace of, from the construction industry standpoint, especially going forward to what in, in the future, is we had a tremendous number of people leave the industry. I mean, um, uh, in, in find other careers. They were previously had enjoyed a large degree of success for many, many years in the construction industry and made a lot of money. And then when this recession came, it came so fast and so sudden, they were unprepared, as uh, my industry does a lot of, a lot of times. And um, they just got out. And, the, and that's okay that they get out. What we found, though, is that they are not coming back. Um, out of the 400 people that Martin Harris Construction employs at this point in time, there's only a handful of people that left the industry. One of them went to be a security guard at, uh, at the Hard Rock, and he came back into the industry. But there's such a, such a, a number of people that are choosing not to come back. Every time I run into a, a limo driver or a variety of other places, waiters, bartenders, they all relate back to the construction company, construction business, but they're not going to come back to it, and that's that's a real handicap, and that's the biggest impact that, that this recession made on us. Traditional projects, um, both public and private, have been design bid build. With the increased workload on the design community, do you believe this will lead to projects being awarded under alternate delivery methods, such as uh, construction manager at risk or guaranteed maximum price? The answer is yes, and we're already seeing that right now. 
Um, the school district has put out several schools under CMAR, construction manager at risk, programs because it's been proven that they can get the school to the students faster and more economically than with a, with a traditional design bid build. The convention center is going to be a CMAR type of project. And uh, I think you're going to see more and more of that. Private industry has been doing that in some form or another for many years, uh, going all the way back into the days when Howard Hughes was extremely busy. They were used in a form of design bill, uh, CMAR. Uh, they hired an architect and they'd hire a contractor on the front end to do, together the two would bring would be bring the project to fruition. So the private industry has known about that for a long time. Now, state government, um, NDOT does a tremendous number of CMAR contracts, uh, like as mentioned, the convention center. It's getting to be a better, uh, a faster delivery system. And we're finding there's an advantage to the design community and, a design, and a, an advantage to the ownership. The advantage to the design community is that um, they spend less time on the back end on construction administration because of the fact that many of the questions that would come up during the construction process are addressed during the design process, if that makes sense. John, you mentioned um, things like the sports industry coming here. Um, what other things, or does Las Vegas have the right stuff to become a global city um, and not just a global destination? You know, I, I, I get that question asked a lot, and you know, what's it going to take for Las Vegas, sort of the, the join the, the ranks of the um, uh, U.S. cities that are kind of being seen as global cities? Uh, and it's going to take a while. We're still a relatively small metro area. We only have about two and a half million to maybe three million people in the metro area. It's still relatively small. And so, but we do have a worldwide reputation. And the question, as, as, as an entertainment capital, entertainment destination, so is how do we grow that and be looked at as, as a more serious business environment? And so that takes a lot of what I call time, talent, and treasure to accomplish that. And I would add to that political will to get us there. And so it's going to take significantly more investments than we have in the past, on, let's say on a per capita basis or however you want to rate it, uh, not only on you know, hard infrastructure, roads and bridges and, and that sort of thing, but also in transit, for example, but also what are we doing in terms of investing in our human capital? Uh, and whether that's higher ed training or, or BOTEC training, whether it's training to the, the community college system, and how do we elevate our workforce and get the training that we need or be known as a, as a, as a community that invests in its workforce so that companies become uh, get attracted here. And so that's the real critical part for us to move to that next level. There are a lot of folks in town that think having, the, the, having that sports orientation, and a, a, a professional sports orientation, is going to bring it, be, make causes to be viewed as more of a larger global city, if you want to call it that. I'm not sure that's going to get us there. I mean, there's a lot of cities around the country that have sports teams that are not viewed as global cities. So I'm not sure having the, that, that kind of asset necessarily means that's going to, what's going to happen. But I think the investments in through K through 12, as we all talk about here, investments at UNLV, and particularly at the community college system. So we're training mid-skill workers so that when companies are looking at Las Vegas as a place to move uh, and bring their, their uh, their, their organization here, that they, they know they have a workforce that is trainable, that can be depended on to do whatever that is, and it's usually somewhere in the STEM, you know, science, science technology, engineering, and math. And it doesn't have to be college folk, college graduates. It has to be someone made with an associate's degree, some type of technician, engineering technologist is another name that, uh, that those folks are called. That's why we, I think, we need to focus our efforts to go to that next level. We just need to get serious about it and and uh, really you know, understand what our assets and what are and what they are and what our liabilities are before we can go that way. Yeah, I, would, I would add on to what John said about that, that middle section um, at the community college level, College of Southern Nevada, and, and um, also at the high school level. Uh, a few years ago, uh, and some of the design professionals out here has probably been involved in it, uh, Clark County School District developed this Career Technical Training Center concept. And um, our company was fortunate enough to get to build one of those. But then, since then, we've kind of adopted that school as a, 
as a, as a child, if you will, and we bring four to five to six students in, uh, juniors and seniors that are in the construction management program. But they don't only do construction management programs there, they do technology, they do a wide range of vocational type training. And you can go there for a couple of years and you come out and a year later go into CSN, you mm -hmm. come out with a mid-level degree and um, I think that I think there needs to be absolutely more focus. Let's face it, folks. There's 20 percent, maybe 25 percent of the population is going to go get a four-year degree. Right. So it's important we focus on that middle strata where the vast majority of the population is, making them employable to the people that want to come to Las Vegas. Right. That's exactly right. Yes, those mid skills that are really critical. Most companies are looking for mid skill workers. They don't necessarily need folks with PhDs and and uh, master's degrees, and, you know, and, and for example, in a kind of a, a dopey profession like mine, like economics, and we've got enough of those guys around. We need people that are engineers that understand, understand math, science, and, and that can be all done at really at the community college level. And, you know, a lot of folks don't know this, but the state of Nevada gets a little over 100, maybe 150 million a year from the feds for workforce training dollars. Uh, we, and so the, the question I always ask is how is that money being spent? And what programs? I know there's about 30, 40 million at the Workforce Connections folks get. That's the Department of Labor, the state. And they do a really good job trying to use that money well for workforce training. But there's another 50, 60, 70 million dollars that we don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying it's being wasted. I just don't know where it's going. So we really need to kind of evaluate at the state level how we're spending all this money that we're getting. And, on, and are we using most efficiently to attract companies? It's not a matter of that, are we better, a better place to do business in California. We are. It's that we're competing with, not with California necessarily, but we're competing, we're competing with Texas. We compete with Arizona and Utah and uh, New Mexico and a number of other states that have far more advanced and more well-developed workforce training uh, programs in place. And so we just need to understand that those are, that's our competition, not, not California. Uh, with projects like the Convention Center, which you mentioned, the stadium, um, we have resort projects happening like Fountain Blue, Resorts World, others. Do you see these projects impacting other off-strip uh, project types, such as the new Amazon Fulfillment Center, other large e-commerce projects that are coming here, um, other things that are sort of looking at diversification of our economy? How, how is the, the strip work impacting that? So from the construction industry standpoint, we have a couple of concerns, and it involves the design industry. I don't know, but maybe you guys have suffered the same kind of situation that the construction industry had suffered, and that is people left the profession, whether it's the mid-level CAD operators, et cetera, and now getting, trying to get them to come back. Where our concern is in the construction industry, especially off-strip, because our company does the, the vast majority of the work off-strip. We did the Amazon Fulfillment Center. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> but um, our, our concern is, is that the workload on the design community seems to be getting heavier and heavier and heavier, especially when it comes to civil, the civil side and the structural side. We're seeing an impact, and mechanical too, to a certain degree. Um, the A&E people seem better the architectural side seems to be better situated to farm that out to other branch offices than the mechanical and plumbing electrical and civil side. So we're seeing projects delayed right now and we haven't even hit the, 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 the bulk of the work that's coming up on the civil side. We're seeing it hit um, and cause delays within the public works at Clark County. And we're seeing a lot of that kind of stuff. And, and like I said, we're just, we're still on the uphill side of this curve. Mm -hmm. And so there's a concern in the construction industry that the design industry, there's a concern for us being able to keep up with it, but there's also a concern that the design industry is, is, is not coming up, uh, will not come up or can, no, I shouldn't say will not, cannot come up fast enough to meet the demand that we have here. I mean, and, and, and from our standpoint, because we look at things a little, a little more higher level in terms of, you know, at the 30,000 foot level of Frank's kind of in the trenches with stuff, this stuff. But you're right, this whole issue of, uh, goes back to workforce, what's the availability of the workforce, or what, what kind of professions are 
kids getting into, what happened to all those folks after the recession. Uh, and that's all plays into all this. And then on top of that, you had all these disasters that we're seeing, whether it's a Hurricane Maria, then in Puerto Rico, or a Harvey, or Irma, now the, the stuff in, in, in California. It kind of sucks those, those, com those construction resources to a variety of different locations. So that adds on to all these costs. Now, from our standpoint, we look at if we're going to, if the resort industry or lodging hospitality is going to remain our core industry for a while, and it is, you know, as much as we've done in the area of economic diversification development in Southern Nevada in the 30 plus years that I've been here, uh, we are still representing, if you go back, let's say, 20 years, uh, the resort industry, the lodging, hospitality industry, I should say, still, still represents about a third of all our jobs. No matter how much all the other industries have grown, it's still about 30% of our jobs. And for better or worse, it's the low, lowest paying 30%. Uh, there's not the high, high, it's not a high wage industry. So we have that challenge a, a little bit. But what we need to kind of look at that sometimes I don't think we focus on as much in terms of economic development efforts, when we see these kind of projects being built, is what do we do to grow the, the sectors that support that major industry? For example, there's a lot of manufacturers that are directly related to the lodging hospitality industry. Are they all here? Where are they? And what do we need to do to attract those kind of, you know, that supply chain, if you want to call it that, of, of the resort industry, to attract those companies here? Because they do produce pretty high paying um, and, and technical jobs. That's something we really kind of need to look at uh, a little more closely, I think, than we have. The other area that's really critical to us, it's kind of sitting over there on the east side of town, and sometimes we don't think about it so much because we've been here so, for so long as Nellis. So you have these folks at Nellis, they're very highly trained uh, military people, uh, not necessarily the ones that are going into battle, but the technology people that, in the military, uh, the logistics people, for example. And what do we do to keep them here in the valley? And what kind of job opportunities can we have for them when they retire out of the military? How do we grow that, quote unquote, economic cluster to make it part of our resource base of here? And our resource being what I'm talking about, our human resource base. So there's a lot of things that we have that sometimes I think we need to focus on a little bit more that, than we have been. Uh, and so I think we have all the, the pieces there to, to grow and develop our economy, not just grow it from a resort standpoint. It's just focusing on it and understanding that it's gonna require a lot of investment uh, in, in an over, over a period of time. And that's one of the things that I think is really kind of our challenge here in Southern Nevada. We get resort properties built pretty quick, we get developments built pretty quick, but economies don't take a lot longer to change. It just requires a concerted effort for a long period of time. So uh, there are folks here in this conference that are from all the Western states, not just in Nevada. And one of the things that we do here really well is hospitality. Um, how is the hospitality work that's happening or these new projects affecting the entire region, um, maybe in terms of labor or, uh, I don't know, materials, um, you know, the transportation that's happening, all of those things. Could you maybe address that, Frank? Yes. Uh I think uh, we have operations in California and Arizona as well, and, and when these larger projects start up, like the Convention Center, um, uh, Resort World, Fountain Blue, um, and then you have MGM and Caesars that's got ongoing improvement programs that are sucking up a lot of people. When, when those projects start up and get full-blown go full going, the Raider Stadium, of course, can't be ignored. It's going to have an impact on the ability to, of, of contractors in the, I would say, probably within the seven or 800, maybe 900 mile radius of Las Vegas to be able to compete. Because let's face it, a, drywall, a drywaller can come here and go to work on the Fountain Blue or on Resorts World, and, and the amount that goes on his checks is about $62 an hour. And in, those out, in Phoenix, Arizona, it's nowhere near that. You go to San Francisco, uh, it, it is, but you go right next door to Sacramento, it's a half that. And so I think you're going to see a migration of the construction trade workers coming here because they're attracted by the money. Now the materials is a huge, is a huge deal. Um, we're fortunate here, we got two or three drywall plants and that's the, that is the critical piece right now because of Harvey and Irma and all of these. It's sucking every piece of drywall from a seven or eight hundred mile radius around Houston, uh, away from, and, and maybe even farther. 
we're fortunate here, we got the plants here, but their production is all going east. It's not going west. It's, and, and, for the, and a lot of it is, is, is going farther west, meaning California. So it impacts the material. Cement is another major issue. We have to go to California to get our powder. And a major thing happened in California for, uh, within the, that microclasm of the, of the powder manufacturers there, we're sunk. And so the materials is just as critical as the, as the um, labor. Steel, on the other hand, we've not reached, although the price of steel is going up dramatically, we've not reached a supply issue, it's just a cost issue at this point. Mm -hmm. John, what about in terms of, you talk about labor here, but do you think labor is going to be coming from those other markets? Do you see that in your research? A, to a certain degree, but I mean, uh, the economy is improving all over the country right now, so development is coming back uh, to varying degrees all over the country. Some, some markets, uh, regions, metro areas are growing faster than others, so there's a huge demand for development. There's a lot of money flowing into development uh, as, a, as a safe harbor, for lack of a better word, or an, an additional place to invest in addition to stocks and bonds. And so as the economy continues to improve, uh, you're going to see this growing demand for, for construction uh, projects all over the country. So and now we get onto that disasters. And I'm sure the feds are going to acquire some priority to those, those, those disasters get dealt with first. You know, and so it's going to affect you know, uh, developments everywhere. But everyone's being affected by the same thing, a shortage of construction labor, rising demand for real estate developments, uh, which is going to have an impact on pricing. Uh, and God forbid if China gets, starts getting busy again with its development program, starts keeping some of those products there, don't, doesn't export them here. Uh, right now they're slower, so we, we're getting a, we have an advantage on a materials cost standpoint. But at some point it'll correct, right? And so it's, it's a supply demand issue, and so pro the factories will get going again faster, the job will go up. Finally, we've seen wages going up, which is a big deal to attract workers. You know, that's one of the other challenges. I think when people are saying, you know, we have all these jobs that are begging, we have this wage gap, and we have demand for jobs all over the country, and why aren't uh, we, we're filling these jobs and getting, whether it's developments getting built or factory, factory jobs and all these sorts of things. And that's because companies up until just recently have constrained wages. They've made a lot of profits over the last few years as a way to build up their nest eggs, so to speak, their rainy day funds to weather the next downturn, and it will come. We'll have another downturn, it always happens. But wages have still been relatively stagnant across the board, and so finally wages are starting to go up. And we look at wages going up when we look at after you adjust for inflation. And that's kind of the final key of the, of the, 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 the key in the, you know, piece in the puzzle is wages are finally going up now. That has, has good and bad, right? It costs things, the price of goods and services go up, but also spending power goes up too. <laughs> so. But you do have to have that balance of a, a variety of factors. We're just uh, trying to adjust to after this great recession really threw a lot of the, a lot of the systems out of whack. And we saw, well, we're trying to recover from that at this point. So, but I think it's moving forward, barring any kind of craziness overseas with some kind of war or something. You know, you guys, I, I think we're, we're in for a, a period of pretty decent growth. And companies will just start adjusting to that growth and starting to pay greater wages. I think Frank hit on the net. If you have a choice as a drywaller to pay, get 62 bucks in Vegas, or 30 or 40 someplace else, you'll take you'll take the trip. Now, at the same time, let's all be aware we can't depend on construction workers as a core industry. Construction by itself is not a primary industry. It comes and goes based on the flows of the economy. We got to thinking. Uh, that it was a prime industry for a long time. You know, the old adage in Vegas was, you know, you had construction workers building houses for construction workers. And that only lasts so long. So as long as we understand that it's, we need the construction workers now, what do we need to do to attract them, but not have an economy based on construction activity. This is something that uh, we need to hopefully learn from the last recession. So one of the things, that, you know, we're, we're concerned about labor now, and there are shortages everywhere you go. I, I know... I sat down with a, a major apartment developer here in Las Vegas, and he is running three to six months behind because of one trade drywall. And, and so if you think about this, and we've got effectively four Bellagio hotels or four Wins or four Venetians starting within the next, within 90 to 120 days of each other. 
Um, the stadium is, uh, depending on who you listen to, 1.5 to 1.6 billion. Uh, World Resorts, to me, is probably going to spend maybe a couple of a couple of billion. Convention Center overall is going to be around almost two. 1.3 is the official budget, but we know how that goes. <laughs> and and um, and then you have the Fountain Blue that is a billion or a billion and a half. And all of those projects are starting basically at the same time, and they're all scheduling finishing, especially the convention center and the stadium along about 2020. And so I would submit to you that the beginning of 2019, there is, that's when the firestorm is gonna start. Mm -hmm. Now, you got, if you take a look, architecturally, there'll be four or five firms affected at the convention center. I don't know how many affected at the, at the Bellagio or at the other projects I just referred to. But when you stop and think about the fact that John just got through saying, or what we heard in another, in another uh, deal we, we were at a week ago, we, we do this a lot. Don't we? Like a team. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm his caretaker. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we're running, I think the guy from Lucky Dragon yeah, said, 91% yeah. occupied on the strip right. now. Week in, week out. 91%, okay? If you think about the convention center doubling its space in between now and 2020, the Raider Stadium, where's those people going to stay? Well, you got Fountain Blue and you got Resource World. And, and so you bring all of those to a head starting beginning, the night of, beginning of, of 2019 and finishing somewhere around August, September of 2020, you're going to have such a demand on everything. Now, if you guys think about it, uh, where I was going with this too, that was for the A&E industry, is that the ancillary stuff that's developed, the secondary, the second tier jobs you right. were talking about, John, all of those people need to be housed someplace in warehouses, in office buildings, mm -hmm. in all of that. They need to be housed someplace. So then you throw that on top of it because there's, for every primary job we generate, what, two or three secondaries? It, it, it depends on the industry, but let, let's, say, let's say one and a half. Okay, one so and one and a half. So if you, if you, if you have uh, another one and a half jobs for every primary job being generated, where does those people go to work at? That means more warehousing, it means more office buildings, it means more medical clinics, it means more hospital beds. There's a lot of stuff that ends in there and it's, enters in there. And that's why, as an industry, the construction industry is worried about what's going to happen. Not right now today, we're getting along okay. But a year from now, I can't tell you it's going to be so much okay. And you guys are going to be impacted six or eight months from now because somebody out near the radio stadium is going to contact you, you, or you and say, I want to build this. Right. And then you got to have the resources to do it with, right? Yeah, the, it's interesting, the construction multiplier effect of those big primary construction jobs, then it flows into the commercial and residential real estate is pretty significant. We haven't seen the impact of that yet, and so that's going to have a dramatic effect. The other thing that we haven't talked about yet is public works. Hmm. And so there's a lot of money now going into public works as well. You know, as you guys know, folks who don't know, not from here, the, uh, Las Vegas has fuel revenue indexing. So... Uh, 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 fuel tax is now uh, indexed at the rate of inflation in the producer price index, and it's producing quite a bit of money. The, that's the state, the state gas tax, not the federal tax, obviously. And so it's producing quite a bit of money. It's all got to be allocated to roads. It can't be used for transit. And so the RTC is collecting all these dollars, and you know, the tourists pay for it, and the residents pay for it, obviously, as they drive their cars. And so they have a lot of plans for real estate, uh, 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 road development. Uh, and so as that grows and population grows, then the water authority gets more money to all the in, in, people doing hookups, water hookups, so they're generating money for their infrastructure program. So there's a huge amount of slosh, so to speak, of cash going into the funds for public works as well, but with the shortage of construction workers, right? And so while they may not all be the same trades, you know, obviously you don't do drywall or building a road, it all, it all affects everything. And so there's these big concerns at this point is how we're going to deal with all this growth over the next four to five years. Uh, and so the challenge, though, which is kind of interesting, we're starting to see the same talk. I heard it at a, at a presentation yesterday. We saw it during 04 and 05 and 06. And that is we're entering a period of growth, hyper growth, that will never end. 
Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's never going to end. We're back stronger, faster, better than ever before. And we need to gear up all our systems. We need to gear up everything, financing, everything, all the, all the things that work in this high growth environment. We need to get all these things back in place because Vegas is going to go to the moon again. Well, you know what happened, right? And so we just need to be a little cautious. While there are real concerns in the short term, for example, in, in, in Bob's industry and in your industry, trying to find the, the right number of professional designers and things like this, we also have Bob? to be aware. Oh, Bob. <laughs> so why am I calling Bob? Do you have another Let person you care to? I'm thinking this other guy. Bob who said the same thing that Frank said. That Frank said, I'm sorry. I, I, I like to call him Bob. Uh, <laughs> in fact, his brother Bob is a much nicer guy. But, okay, James. <laughs> Jack James. Oh, James was an asshole. I can tell you that. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, we just need to figure out that while well, we need to get geared up, these, this wave will be gone by 2025. Yeah. 2030. It's not a permanent wave. And so, how do we manage all this growth and at the same time have enough wherewithal to say, hey, you know, we have to manage growth, but let's keep our rainy day funds safe. Yeah, yep. say, let's keep our reserves together. So, this applies to the small firms like us, to large firms like Frank's, and to every thing in between. So there's a lot of stuff going on. The good news is we're not going backwards and we're not going down. So let's take the time to plan. I know the last, the argument last time around, and I heard a number of people say this, well, it's hard to plan for a downturn when you're going 80 miles an hour down the road. Well, that doesn't mean you can't look around, right? And so we could have looked around a little bit more when we were going 80 miles down the road in 2006 and realized the road was about to end. I wouldn't want to believe it. And so let's just pay, you know, be you know, careful and, and be uh, uh, focused into the future, but also kind of be aware that it's, it's, it's a cycle. We're going through a big boom cycle right now. Let's not assume the boom cycle is permanent. That's all. Do I have any questions from the audience? John, I, I, you do work with the state, I know, on, on some of the legislature and some of their thinking. What, um, are you doing anything there that you can talk about to kind of deal with what you were suggesting as an issue to look at certain industries and how we can educate correctly to get, build our workforce? Yeah, I mean, I know the state of Nevada through GOED, the Governor's Office of Economic Development, and it, there are various economic development authorities that they work with, which is LVGEA, the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance down here, and uh, the Economic Development Authority of Western Nevada and the North, which is Reno, and there's a two or three other ones scattered out in the rural counties, are all looking at this whole issue of workforce. It really came to a head because of Tesla and the Tesla effect up in the Reno area. Reno area's got some huge challenges that we don't even have here. Housing prices are going through the roof. There's a housing shortage there, and there's a shortage of labor uh, in, in terms of skilled labor. So they're dealing with that right now. So there is a lot of effort being placed right now on how we're using state resources to fund workforce development programs and how we are better using that 100 plus million or so that I mentioned earlier from the feds on workforce training. Um, the other thing that's coming into play, which is interesting, which is part of this whole Lost, you know, Nevada diversifying its economy thing, which is kind of a weird word, weird way of diversification, but it's coming. And that is whole, this whole issue of uh, the adult use marijuana industry. As you guys know, that all went legal in July. So all those dispensaries are up there working, the testing labs, the grow facilities, and all those sorts of things. And all manufacturing that comes from that industry has to be done in state. So whether it's, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the pens and the, the edibles and the, you know, the, uh, the marijuana cigarettes and the, the plants themselves, the, the, the blossom, what is it called, the blossoms, whatever it's called, all that, all that is being done here. And so how is, is that going to affect the whole economy? Is that going to help the economy overall or not? Uh, the other thing, too, is this issue of logistics. As L.A. and the ports of Long Beach and, uh, and L.A., as well as you see the ports in, 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 in Oakland, as they start getting full and so they continue to get maxed out in terms of their capacities, what is that going to do to shift uh, uh, companies into the interior of the U.S.? And then when you add to that the whole issue of the, the Panama Canal being widened, company, uh, shift being able to go from China, not even hit the West Coast, go through the Panama Canal and, and service, be serviced by the ports in, in the Gulf of Mexico and the East Coast, how does that affect all these dynamics? We're, we're really starting to look at things on a regional basis now. It's not just Nevada. It's kind of the western region, the mountain west region. How do all these economies 
work together, both in terms of labor force availability and quality, as well as infrastructure, uh, as well as uh, the other component, it's a real big one that we often forget about, I think, is quality of health care, which is a big driver for where com why companies go where they go and why they established operations, not just low taxes, for example. So the issue about the health care niche or cluster in a community really affects how companies make decisions of where we're going to be. So there's so much going on right now, combined with competing now globally, which is another major part of it. We don't have time for that today. So there's a lot going on today, but I think if we started looking at things more regionally, like California, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah looking at things together, uh, or maybe Colorado, uh, that's, uh, that's kind of how we should be looking at things at, uh, at, at, at a certain level. We can't just be looking at things at the state of Nevada or just Clark County any longer. Those days are gone. Brad? Well, having been here 35 years myself, I've been on that roller coaster you guys have talked about, the up and down of our economy. And one of the other areas that really gets hit is our planning departments and building departments and inspections. You know, we wait and wait and wait, wait for this in this period. So one of my questions is what you guys might think, how you supplement, because they also shrunk. Our depart government departments have been shrinking them. For for us, um, we would love to see them supplement from the private sector. Our concern, though, it gets back down to the to the capacity issue again. Is that how much capacity does the private sector, and that's pretty much you guys, in in the engineers, how much capacity do you have to be able to lend to? or rent to a building department. Um, I would submit over the course of the next 24 to 36 months, there's not gonna be much of that. Your capacity is gonna pr be pretty well eaten up right here. Um, I'm, I'm not in the transportation industry, but I sit on Nevada Department of Transportation Board of Directors. And one of our biggest issues now is getting projects, uh, as you mentioned, the RTC has got a lot of money um, getting projects turned out so that we can actually put them out to bid. Um, and there are people that's, Las Vegas Paving, I was talking to one of their folks the other day, they got 300 people sitting at home. There's $250 million of the work waiting for the engineers to finish up so they can put it, so the RTC can put it out to bid. So there is an overall capacity issue. I don't know how many of you do work in North Las Vegas, John Lee and the North Las Vegas Building Department and Public Works Department put in a program where um, I call it, for lack of a, they have a specific term, and I think it's this. It's called, it says self-certifying, where we can submit a set of drawings, and about 12 days later, as long as we self-certify, and that's a teamwork between the engineer, the design team, and the contractor, self-certify the drawings, um, the owners can choose to move forward in that, within that 12 day period of time. And that seems to be for, uh, when we're doing a lot of work in North Las Vegas, um, in the last year and a half, we've completed 3.2 million square feet out on, out on the Interstate 15 corridor. And um, we're doing a lot of that work. And we just started a big, a big project for Clearwater Paper. And, and it's all self-certified. The design is self-certified. Now, if there's follow-up. But what allows the owner to do at risk is to get into the ground. The process that's being used in the city of Las Vegas and, and Clark County doesn't even allow the owner to take the risk of going into the ground. North Las Vegas allows the owner to take the risk. And so when he relies on the contractor and the design team, it takes the workload off of public works. They're able, they're able to schedule things better in North Las Vegas than any one of the other two entities. So that's, that's a case where innovation mm -hmm. stepped up to a need. Supplementation, uh, we did that back in the, in the, in the uh, 04, 05, 06 era, era, and it came from all over the place. It came from Arizona, it came from Utah, it came from all over the place. I, something needs to be done with those departments. For us, public works is the, big, the single biggest area. Clark County Building Department are reasonably responsible, responsive. City of Las Vegas is a little bit less so. And, and I, some of you are probably from that area, and I'm sorry, but, uh, you know. 
What about Nevada? I'm retired now. I don't depend on it. <laughs> you can say anything now. Well, I hear also, too, Frank, Nevada Energy is an issue. Yeah, oh, Envy Energy, getting, getting power service to a piece of property now is horrible. It just, it's, uh, yeah, we talked about this. There's, there's, uh, there's only so much ground that has got all the four components, water, sewer, power, and, and, and storm facilities, and, and also uh, gas to them. There's only so much property that's got that. And, and NV Energy is no longer building a substation reactively. In other words, going, I mean proactively, going out and building them, which they used to do. Now they wait until there's so much pent up demand that people are screaming to get power, then they'll finally kick out a substation with the property owner's participation in it. And, and it, it's, got, it's got development on the, on the other industries absolutely hamstrung. Now, amazingly enough, what I heard the other day at this NAOP thing that, that um, John uh, chaired a panel on, um, the stadium's already got their power. I wonder how that happened. <laughs> Our little old developer wants to build 3 million square feet. He can't get power, but the stadium's already got their power. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how that yeah. stuff happens. Probably by accident. Right? Yeah, it was. <laughs> divine design. Yeah, yeah, exactly, divine design. But yeah, I mean, these are economic, you know, and sometimes we don't think about it in this context. These kind of holdups, um, and this is probably happening all over the country, so we can't whine too much. We're in pretty good shape compared to a lot of other places, but it has economic development impacts yep. and economic growth impacts. It's just not the construction guys can't get built something for a private client or we didn't get an extra lane built on the, you know, the beltway. These have dramatic effects on how competitive we stay as a, as a region when we're, we're, we're trying to attract companies and businesses and, and, and population. And so it's something we all need to think about, just like we need to think about the quality of our, I, I saw Tom Schumann here, because he's been involved a lot in the healthcare for a long time. How do we grow uh, our healthcare cluster, mm -hmm. our healthcare industry as another form of infrastructure, so to speak? and uh, to continue attracting, attracting companies. You know, I often don't think that the utility providers in this community, whether it's Nevada Energy, Southwest Gas is pretty good at that, and maybe even some of the jurisdictions, the public sector folks fully understand that how quickly they get projects approved really has an effect on jobs and wages and economic growth and, and GDP, so we call it Metro GDP, the gross domestic product for the, for the region, and how that really has a long-term effect on uh, the growth potential of, of our community and what we can afford for schools and roads and all these other things. But it's all related. Growth kind of drives tax revenues, right? So it's all related to the tax revenue side of things. So, paint a picture for you. It was big news that they, Amazon wanted to build a $5 billion headquarters and employ 50,000 people. And they're going to spend a while doing a site, a site survey, a site study, figured out where they want to go. Let's just take any company. They'll spend two to three years figuring out where they want to move. And they do all kinds of studies. I've been involved with LVGEA for several years now. And the, and the amount of studies that these companies go through, figuring out exactly where they want to move their company to. Now they've spent all this time figuring out Las Vegas is the place. And you go to NV Energy or, or the Southern Nevada Water Authority or the, or the Public Works uh, organization and you find out that it's going to take you a year and a half to get power and get your project through the, the through the approval process. That is a real motivator for them to come to Las Vegas, isn't it? Phoenix, Just, here we come. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Or Houston, Texas, Houston. Dallas, Texas. Wood, wood is a is a major major issue. I was just involved in a conversation at at uh, Martin Harris's office uh, day before yesterday. So, uh, President Trump signed in a a law uh, when he one of the first things he did was was put a tariff on Canadian lumber, and thinking that it would promote domestic lumber, and it did. Uh, but domestic lumber raised their price up with Canadian prices. The problem is they weren't ready for the production needs. Yeah. Okay, they weren't ready for the production. So we've had clients. We had 
we had a, a project that went up $1.2 million um, just in wood costs, right within, within 60 days of that tariff being enacted because it wasn't just a matter of, of paying the money. It was also a matter that the project was going to be slid 60 days, putting us into winter, doing our taping and painting when schedules get slowed down because it's cold. And, and so, because we just couldn't get it. He wanted, and I think he did the right thing by you know, making America great again and, and promoting American manufacturing and so on. The American industry just wasn't ready to take on that load. The lumber mills, the, the, the lumberjacks, all you know, going from the forest lands all the way to the finished product, they weren't ready for that load. And, and so it slowed the whole process down. So wood is a major issue at this point in time. It's starting to get worked out, but um, uh, earlier this year it was a, a major deal. Uh, I like to focus on buying, buying American products. Um, many of the government agencies have been doing that for years, and now we're finding clients doing exactly the same thing. No, 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 I'm not interested in the, in the stuff from China. I want it American made. And, and I like that idea. We, as, a, as an American manufacturing group, or the American manufacturing group, kind of got blindsided by that move because they, weren't, they didn't have the capacity. And so sometimes a client that wants to buy domestic glass, we have to go out of the country to get it because the glass kilns are just jammed. The delivery time's too long. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's the wood, is, I'm glad you brought that up. I'd forgotten totally about that. We don't do a lot of wood building, but there is a lot of them being built right now. Because of the hurricanes you mentioned, and now all the fires in California, I mean, thousands of homes, it sounds like that uh, already. Uh, wood is going to be, continue to be an issue, uh, shipping wood to other parts of the country and so on. Do you think, with all the construction coming here, uh, that you talked about, Frank, are, are, is it just going to drive wages double of what they are? I mean, we went through some of that during the heyday where things got just crazy. Absolutely, the cost of labor is going to go up. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say 30, 40 percent is going to very easily go up 15 to 25 percent. Um, what's What's going to be the biggest impact that you're going to feel? If you remember back in 2005, if you wanted to buy a house, a production house, you bought the house six, seven, eight months before you were allowed to close escrow on it. And, and I was just talking to an attorney friend of mine this morning, and uh, one of his clients is a major, major, long-time home builder in Las Vegas, and he's having to now stretch, stretch. And this guy's built hundreds of thousands of single-family homes, not in just Las Vegas, but all over the place, Oklahoma, everywhere. He's now having to stretch the completion of these houses out 60 days longer, making the cost of money higher, making the cost of everything higher, because he simply can't get the people at this point in time in the housing industry to produce the produce the, uh, single family homes. And the Northern California deal, I, I was looking at a video uh, just before I came over here today showing a neighborhood that must have had 500 homes in it. Gone. It's leveled. It's down it to nothing. It is gone. The only thing left there is the asphalt on the street and the concrete on the sidewalks and the concrete on the slab. Other than that, it is gone. And it went on. I mean, it's a huge development. It's just gone. And yeah, there's all of this stuff is going to... Manufacturing, steel, wood, all that kind of stuff, they're going to see a real heyday for the next five years, six years, something like that. They're in the foreseeable. I think that the with all the construction projects finishing in 2020, I was talking to a friend of mine earlier this morning, and, and he made the statement that he's thinking about buying a house. And he was worried about the appreciation as already, I said, you should have did that three years ago. Okay? Right? But we're going to have, I believe, through 2022, some really good years of appreciation on 
houses, for an example. Because these major projects finish in 2020, there is going to be a tidal wave behind that of other jobs lasting out to maybe 2022. So there will be a chance for, and that was my advice to him, there's a chance for appreciation on your home you buy today for the next five years. After that, you better be prepared to get rid of it. Or even maybe in four and a half years, be prepared to, get, to, to dump it. Because I don't know what's going to happen beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, would you see the economic impact of the convention center and the stadium going beyond 2020 when they open, John? Yeah, that's always a big talk about these kind of facilities. What are the long-term effects on the economies of these kind of facilities? But I can tell you is, you know, we were involved uh, on behalf of clients looking at the, at the Raiders Stadium when it was going through the public process of 13 months or so. And a lot of the research that we did and the reports that we read, and you know, there's a, a huge number of studies that have been done all over the world on uh, the impacts of professional stadiums and convention centers on economies. Uh, particularly those that have public money. Uh, and what you, what you generally, the consensus is among all these research reports, they're done by academics, some by think tanks, some by consultants working for the stadiums or the, the public sector folks that are, that are involved or the communities, is that convention centers have a, a, a pretty good potential for helping diversify and grow economies because conventioneers, when they come to town, uh, particularly if they're attracted to here on conventions because the quality of the facilities are here for business. Mm -hmm. And so they, they may get familiar with the community and maybe bring their business here or do an expansion in the community because they're here doing business. Uh, it's not so sure of when you're doing professional football stadiums or basketball or baseball, whether those kind of invest, public investments have a long-term effect on economies. They may have a long-term effect on attracting different kind of tourists and different types of spending by the tourists, but it doesn't necessarily mean because you have an NFL team here or an NBA, a Major League Baseball team or an NBA team, it's going to dramatically affect the, the wages and the economy of the community in terms of creating a tech industry or manufacturing or any of those other things. So we just have to be careful what they do and what they don't do. Now we have to always say that all economic activity by definition is good. So you have greater economic activity, you have more revenues, uh, more taxes, wages can go higher for a while. So it, it, it keeps, continues, there's this, this, this virtuous loop, as we call it in economics, of, of, of revenue that flows in on a variety of different fronts. And so it, pro, it prolongs economic growth and, and hopefully at some point raises wages. That doesn't necessarily mean it produces economic diversification and economic development, but it's all, it's all good. At some point, though, things slow down. And so things adjust. We get too superheated in the real estate market or the development industry, uh, or the convention center uh, builds too much capacity, or whatever happens at the end of the five, six, seven, eight year period, and we have another business cycle. That's just kind of normal. We've got a pretty good business cycle going here. We're now nine years into a growth cycle that should have only lasted about eight years. So how much longer this can go before something adjusts, we don't know. But we definitely have at least two or three, four more years based on all these planned construction projects that happen. It's, but at the same time, don't spend your money. Cash, uh, complete, keep cash. <laughs> you, never, you can never go broke having cash. Okay, it may not be generating a lot of return on investment sitting in a savings account or in a CD or whatever you put it in, but keep enough in cash for, for, uh, for, the, for, the, for that rainy day because it's going to happen sooner or later, right? Yep. And that advice goes for the state and county governments. Yeah, too. exactly right. Well, on that note, I again want to thank Hilti for sponsoring this session, and I want to say a special thank you to John and Frank for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.